My name is Lou Jansen Dangs Allen, and I'm an immigration lawyer speaking to you here from Toronto in Ontario from the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations. I'm joined by my colleague, Will Tao. Will, go ahead. My name is Will Tao, and I'm an immigration refugee lawyer here in Burnaby, British Columbia, on the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Kaikat Nations. Fantastic. And today, what we're going to do, it's a special episode because immigration just launched a new portal for study permits, for visas to come to Canada. And what we're going to do is sort of like an unboxing Mm -hmm. episode. Will and I have not actually dived deep into this particular portal. This is new to us. So you'll have to excuse us if we kind of like try to figure out how to get through it. But, uh, you know, Will and I are kind of like veterans when it comes to like the portals that immigration has put out there for the representatives, for clients themselves. However, this is completely new. So why don't we get to it? All right. So, Will, you said that we were going to talk about international students and visas. Um, I think it's nice to it's a good idea to show our viewers a bit of the portal. So unfortunately for you guys who are listening to us from Spotify, you won't be able to see anything. We do invite you to go to our YouTube channel to see what we're actually talking about, but we will try to be as descriptive as possible. Absolutely. And this is really exciting because it's really changing the game and putting the control in the hands of the applicants. They're getting essentially what we've gotten a lot of in our own rep portal, but they're also, you're also seeing forms look more, a little bit more like express entry. So this is actually a big development, something I know a lot of people have been calling for in the pandemic, and we're eager to show you unwrap, so to speak, this portal. I'd say even pre-pandemic, but it's interesting that the pandemic kind of like uh, created an impetus to push the department to go forward with it. And I'm really glad that our friends over at IRCC are rolling this out. So without further ado, I'm going to share my view of the form that I've been talking about. And so essentially, this is the new IRCC portal. And as I was talking to Will off screen, you basically have to create an account. And I created a personal account for myself, and I'll be logging in using my personal email just to walk you through the, uh, you know, some of the basic features of this portal. And as we go along, we'll be talking about the advantages, the changes, the possible issues that a person could have when creating an application through this portal. So guys, welcome to the My IRCC portal account. You know, when I logged in the first time, a few things struck me. But before I go into what I actually found interesting, why don't you start off with what struck you, Will? Absolutely. So just in the beginning, there's no security questions. I thought that was pretty interesting. But going into the actual portal, I see a system that looks actually quite like our our reps portal. So I think those who are wondering what it's like for a lawyer to manage files on our end, this is very similar to what our portals look like. Although I got to say the user interface is a bit more updated. It's a cl- it's cleaner. It looks it's nicer. Cleaner, absolutely. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. It, it does look very similar to what a rep portal would have, that you can have multiple applications. Although I understand the old MyCSC account also does that to a certain degree. As you can see in front of you on the screen right now, I actually tried to do a visa application a few days ago just to sort of like go through the motions of doing it. So for today, what we wanted to do is to try to put forward a study permit application. How about we go forward, Will? Sounds good. Let's create our mock study permit application. (laughs) Really exciting. This is a brave new world for IRCC. This is really interesting. Okay, so let's see. It says, get ready to apply for a visit or study in Canada. Make sure you're eligible to apply. Number one, have these items ready. Number three, follow these steps to complete the application. Pretty standard stuff. And of note is that you have 60 days to actually uh, go in and out of your portal account in order to complete the requirements. It also says that you need a credit card or a debit card in order to actually put the application forward. But let's see here. If we click acknowledge and I've read and understood the information above, where do we go? So. What struck me here is interesting, Will, is that there's a lot of preliminary questions and screening, sort of like a screening question, you know, go step by step 
to sort of like filter out if someone's eligible to apply? Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like the come to Canada tool mixed in with electronic application forms. Again, my, my parallel right now is probably express entry. Like it, it, it has the express entry feel to it, especially with the forms that, you know, the one, two, nine, four form in this case, essentially being moved into an electronic version. So I think we can hit no for now. Let's do it for a single applicant just so we can get through the questions quicker, but let's move forward. I was saying that uh, the first question is you want to apply for a study permit and you, let's say you want to apply for a study permit for more than six months. This is interesting. This question I found, tell us more about what you'll do in Canada, include dates. Needless to say, you probably don't want to say that you're going to work without authorization there, but otherwise you should include dates and talk about uh, your study plan essentially briefly here, what, what dates you want to do, you want to study in Canada. Presumably, you can still include a traditional study plan in your study permit application, but it's good to have on hand maybe a paragraph or two that actually talks about your plans while you're in Canada. Sort of like the introduction yeah. of your study plan, for example. Absolutely. 475 characters. I think the great thing about this is it's a little bit more space than the standard forms provided, but mm. you definitely are limited to 475. I wouldn't put too much information in there. I mean, again, I think to mention that you're going to study and here are your dates is probably enough. Where of course, you're studying, gonna... what city, stuff, Absolutely. standard stuff, essentially. So yeah. let's say studying, taking up bachelor's at UBC starting uh, fall 2021. How about that? And let's say the start date would be in September of 2021. Let's just say the first, because I don't know when they actually start over at UBC. Presumably, it's a four-year program, so counting from there, 22, 23, 24, 25, let's say April, and let's say... Just... In a really nice tea, and here's some product placement, just in case. <laughs> Don't worry, we're not getting paid by UBC, guys. And uh, <laughs> you know, if you have a UCI, a unique client identifier, meaning if you've applied to Canada before, probably good to put it in there. If not, they'll find you and they'll put it for you. For now, let's leave it blank. Sounds good. So you said you'll apply for study permit for more than six months. So mm -hmm. um, let's go through some of the questions. Documents that you need to complete the application would be a valid passport, an acceptance letter from a DLI, proof uh, that you have enough money to pay for your tuition, living expenses, uh, return transportation, some information you need to enter, personal details, travel documents, finances, education history, et cetera. So what's interesting, Will, is that basically, as you mentioned, it's very express entry in terms of its feel, but updated. It really replaces, you know, form IMM 1294, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. It does. And as you'll see later on, it, they ask you questions about who you're filling it in for, what they're doing for someone else. So I think definitely there, there is a bit more of a secure nature to having it in a portal as opposed to a form. Because in, in the old forms, for example, you wouldn't even have had to sign off on them. They just validate them unsigned. So this actually gives a, a little bit of a different feel to it, which I think is good. Although I know they're, not, they're recommending or that you don't share your password with individuals. I think that's the confirmation you're getting when you create an account. So hmm. it'll be interesting how reps and the students applying will work together. Yeah. Uh, in this. I think we're going to have to use our own portal. So it says if you're preparing right. an application on someone else, you're a representative. Mm -hmm. well, I actually don't know. Are we supposed to switch this portal now from our, our own portals? My understanding is that not yet. I and mean, I th understand that it's an evolving issue. As we've mentioned in previous episodes, Will and I are part of the Canadian Bar Association, and we know that our table officers or execs at the immigration law section are in constant conversation with the immigration department. And this is an evolving and live issue because as it happens, uh, immigration is still currently figuring out how to roll out the electronic application systems and you know, it's kind of like, uh, let's see how it goes. And our officers um, over at CBA, they're very much reminding our friends over at immigration that, you know, there's a section 91 in the act that uh, allows for representation, guarantees that individuals, applicants have rights to access to a representative. And as it stands, it's an evolving issue. So for now, how about we hit no for, uh, for this question? Let's assume we are a self-represented applicant. Okay, so... Um, travel document information for the applicant. So I'll put my information. Some of them will be fictitious, guys, just because. <laughs> okay, date of birth. Looking Oops. pretty good for 1990 right now. I don't think that's true. 
<laughs> let you figure that out. <laughs> All right, let's say hit those details and then a passport. Okay, so it's a regular passport. This is interesting. The forms are actually very dynamic as opposed to the PDF forms, right? So Absolutely. there's a limitation to how the PDF forms can be dynamic. With the web form, they're able to actually toggle between questions and sort of like works with an algorithm that produces certain questions, sub-questions to a question. So if I select passport and I select regular, I'm able to select my country code here. Let's say the Philippines, nationality, Philippines. Let's see, XX, fictitious number. Okay, now I regret putting up random numbers. I don't remember those numbers. All right, here we go. And date of issue of password, let's just say January 1st. It's interesting though, and you'll, we'll see this later on in, in, in the system, but it actually does keep track of some things. So when you do your personal history, you're going to find that like the schedule A form, the IMM 5669, if there's a clash, it's going to not let you proceed to the next. That's right. We're replacing validation essentially with these electronic forms in the very same way that the 10-year history is done on like express entry, which is... So the next few questions, if you're a representative, these are probably, or if you've done a study permit application, these are familiar questions. They've been ported over to the web form from the PDF. So am I a green card holder? No. Have I had a visitor visa to Canada in the past 10 years? Let's say yes. Do you hold a U.S. non-immigrant visa, like a B1 or a B2 or a J1, for example? Let's do that. I don't have that right now, so let's put a fictitious number. And the expiry date. It's interesting that they're asking for an upload of the U.S. immigrant visa. Eh? That's this right. This is, I feel like it's new from, uh, you know, compared to the 1294. They do ask if you have a green card, but the visa itself is very different. Well, I think also when people applied, there were various practices in terms of like whether their, their entire passport, all stamp pages, or just a biodata page would be included. So I guess this is a way to ensure that they have everything they need, right? So are you using a different passport for this application than the one you, you used to get your U.S. non-immigrant visa? No. Am I traveling by air? Yes. So must be 10 characters less. Oh, <laughs> Oops, see, it actually catches those things. So let's do that. Which country was I born in? Let's say this. Are you a citizen of more than one country or territory? Which country are you a citizen of? Let's say that. Am I doing something wrong with the form up there? I think it's asking for my birthday again. Okay, let's see if I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you have a valid national identity document? Let's just say no. Have you used another name in the past? No. What's your residential address? So let's say I am living in the Philippines, living in an apartment, let's say number five, Taft Avenue, Manila. Oh, so I don't know if I've been to five Taft Avenue, Manila. Have is you it, been? It's, I've never been. It, 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 it is Taft Avenue, you know? There's yeah. It, I think that one should be closer to the National Museum and uh, the, the national part. Yeah. So let's see. Is well, well, LJ's updated, updating this. I want to tell like a brief story of, of Philippines. Sure. I don't think I've ever told you. This was like the craziest thing in Manila. So for some reason, we choose to eat at this restaurant. But to get to the restaurant, you got to go, I think it was by taxi, but it was like going through probably the realest, like real life Manila, right? Not, not like touristy Manila. And we go, but then it, it cuts through it. And then we end up in a different part of town in Manila but the restaurant is called the Aristocrat Restaurant. Oh, yes. I've never had a more conflicting meal <laughs> after driving through like Manila, Manila, like the slums of Manila to go and eat at a restaurant called the Aristocrat Restaurant as a Chinese tourist. I have to, or Chinese Canadian tourist, I'd have to say. Anyways, I just thought about that as, as you brought up Manila. Uh, I remember that restaurant. I'm not even sure if it's still there. But it's an institution. It's uh, next to Plaza Suleiman. Yeah, just in front of the bay, I think. Let's see. I'm just putting fictitious dates here, guys. So I have to bear with our, uh, you know, my slowness with the tech part of this. So I'm just like putting a, an exchange program, I suppose, in Hong Kong. Very fictitious. Countries, one entry must be your current residence. Okay, so it has to be my current residence. <laughs> oh, no. It's like losing. I was like stumped here. One entry must be your current residence, which is set to ongoing. Okay. You gotta put the, yeah, this is where I currently Yeah, live. from, I don't know, March. I did say March 30th, so April 1st. This is where I currently live, for example. Okay, 
So we got that. Huh. <laughs> so, oh, past five years. Okay, sorry about that. Not paying attention, huh? <laughs> right, let's... That's what happens. I got stuck to when I was trying to make my own fictitious one a little while back where I was like, I don't think I remember my dates. Right. Which again, common issue when, when you're when you're creating this stuff. You, it's good to always set out an Excel file or some sort of document. And get right, your yeah. All right, so let's put it to 2020, December. What am I missing here, Will? I think you're... Your citizen of Philippines overlaps with the, that overlaps the second one. So your citizen from January from April two thousand nineteen, and the other one says you are. You know what? Let's let's clean this up. I'm just <laughs> yeah. I'm just gonna put this for the last five years. This is where I currently live. There you let's go. Let's keep it simple. Let's yeah. keep it simple. Look, look, this is good because I think as as you navigate this, you're gonna have to figure out where where what gets you to the next page and what doesn't and you know that's I right i mean it's a good forward. demonstration that the uh, forms themselves are actually very dynamic and uh, you have it, it basically is a big advantage to let's say the pdf forms i know there's a validation button there but yeah. uh, oftentimes people do forget that you know they're leaving a gap there sometimes people forget that there's the 31st of august for example mm -hmm. uh, so let's see do we have your fingerprints and photos and are they still valid so let's say I've applied for a visa for Canada a long time ago. Maybe it's still there. You know, if in doubt, I would say no. But generally speaking, people who have applied for a visa for Canada should have biometrics like captured. If you've applied after, correct me if I'm wrong, sometime in 2019, when they made it practically mandatory for everyone except for U.S. citizens. Exactly. Okay. Going for it. A study permit, I have a letter of acceptance from a DLI. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference between an open study permit and a letter of acceptance from a DLI, Will? Well, there are some individuals who do not need to have a letter of acceptance or letter of acceptance exempt. Can't quite remember the exact ones off the top of my head right now. I'll give yeah. you a classic example. So if your dependent under 18 is accompanying you, if you're an adult yeah. student, that student, that dependent might be eligible for an open study permit, meaning wherever you you would live. For example, if it's Toronto, Richmond, or Burnaby, you just have to sign up at the local school board. So yeah. in this case, we're going for bachelors at UVC. So there's a letter of acceptance. Which of the following applies to you then? An officer of the U.S. NIS or of the U.S. States Customs will carry out pre-inspection. An American member of the International Joint Commission. These are very interesting questions, Will. This isn't yeah. found in the in the classic form one two nine four. What's going on? Yeah, they're asking more specific details, and I think that there there's more filter mechanisms. Like when you when you mm. think about this, you know, we're we're thinking about algorithms now. We're thinking about machine based assessments. Right. These get more inputs to allow the system to eventually make decisions without necessarily needing an officer to read through everything. So. Definitely expect the answers you put into these forms to matter. Not that they didn't matter before, but they're going to matter probably right. even more than they did before. So one thing I would say about these algorithms, uh, th these forms are smart. They're basically designed so that you don't make a mistake. The problem with this is that as we go along with these forms, we get used to them. We get uh, desensitized to them. People will have a tendency to not pay attention to the questions themselves, which could force more errors. So, you know, Folks, slow down when you do these things. So let's say I'm choosing none of the above apply to me. What's the level of study? I already said it was university at a bachelor's. And the DLI number, we have to find that. Now let me find the DLI number for... And just to go back to what LJ was saying earlier, sorry for my blank out. In addition sorry. to minor children whose parents are on temporary resident, other than those whose parents are, are visitors in Canada, mm. those minor children can study on an open study permit. So too can the spouse or common law partner, dependent child of foreign diplomats in, in specific roles, armed forces, duration, short-term study permits, less than six months, mm. and registered Indians under the Indian Act. And also I believe when someone is on maintained status, they can also study at other institutions. I mean, the, the interesting thing is these study permits, even though they are tied to a specific institutional letter of acceptance, it's it's not uncommon for students to come to Canada with one school and then eventually transfer to different ones utilizing the same thing. That's right. We also know that that could be a source of concern and, and it has been in the past. So right. 
this portal and the way that they might be asking for this information now might be a better way for them to track as well when it comes to compliance. So I would put that as a heads up too. Mm -hmm. So be mindful of what you're putting into the forms, guys, because for sure, immigration would have taken into account that people do change programs, change the DLIs, and they probably instituted some measures for them to be able to track this better. Because traditionally, it would have been, uh, you know, an individual trying to update their DLI through their MyCIC portal account, or it could have been just through a web form or through a call through the, the IRCC call center. So, Will, pop quiz for you. What's the address for UBC? I was actually just searching this up right now. <laughs> it's actually a difficult question because UBC has many addresses. Oh. I don't know which one. Can you search by the postal code or does it work that way? I don't know. I, I usually just go by address on the, on Google Maps. <laughs> Google I mean, says it's uh, yeah. postal code. Right. Let's see. Let's yeah, see. So it doesn't I give used to me work on idea. Student Union Boulevard. Have you ever been to the University of British Columbia? Oh, yeah. I have presented there um, back in 2009. I was oh, invited very, to a conference. Very, yeah. Very interesting. I actually grew up on the UBC campus as a little kid. So wow. I spent pretty much most of my life on that campus or around that campus, other than law school, of course, where we went to Ottawa. <laughs> Right. Love the Ottawa or t shirt, uh, what is it, sweater? Yeah, uh, Ottawa. Right. Ottawa. <laughs> it's my parting gift from, uh, I'm trying to find, here we go. Let's just copy that. That's small. That. Yeah. Uh, that would be oh, no, hold on. If you don't see the address, start typing to find the address on the list. Um, West Mall. Oh, oh, so this is great, Will. So this reminds me of Canada Post. They've integrated the address to autofill, eh? Although, there's 157 different addresses. That's right. So we have to find it. 2329. Let's try to type it in as it suggested. 2329 West Mall. Yeah, I think Look you got that. it. You found it. Yay. Wow. Okay. Auto fill. Yes, I am, I am I'm like, very you impressed. And you, you can't find the school that probably suggests maybe that school doesn't exist or something. <laughs> oh, that's so. that's a really good point. That's right. Because in the traditional form, you have to actually like write down and type down the uh, address mm -hmm. of the school. So this one actually like prevents, you know, I suppose like whatever permutation of the spellings of West Mall could be by just like tapping into the Canada Post database, I suppose. How long will I be studying? I did say September of yeah. 2021, uh, let's say the first. And note in the beginning, they asked you a question about your dates already. So this That's is right. a common question where if you forgot or if you don't take proper screenshots and remember, you mm -hmm. might find yourself writing things that are contradictory, which is another thing to- Which they will say. alert you to, yeah. Well, they may not even alert you to it. If oh. by the end of it, you just submit two contradictory pieces, that could just be grounds for your refusal, theoretically speaking. This is hypothetical, guys. I don't know how much you'd be. We're, we're trying to. We're all just trying to figure out what this looks like. But I guess you guys can open this uh, portal with us and and learn as we yeah. learn as well, which is cool. Uh, available other. Let's say two thousand for textbooks and whatnot. Twelve thousand. Is that fair for Vancouver? <laughs> Sorry, that was a rhetorical question. The funds available for stay. Let's say I have twenty thousand readily available. Who will pay? let's say myself or parents. So flag on this one, if you wanna go up a little bit, tuitions for the whole program, remember for funds of stay that you have to demonstrate that you can meet the requirements for the first year of tuition, plus I believe it's four, is it four? I, I can tell you, it's it's uh, basically meet the required fundings for funding for the first year and then demonstrate a high Thousand. probability of meeting the next year, the succeeding years. Absolutely. Cost of studies plus ten thousand dollars plus four thousand per dependent. I thought it was. That's right. Yeah. Sorry. So yeah, it, 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 it depends on the size of the family. That's right. Yeah. So let's just say you're coming alone. So twenty thousand should be more than enough to cover it. Let's just increase that just to be. Let's, you know, let's put it to be a little bit more to be safe, just so yeah. you cover at least tuition, right? Exactly. Uh, even though it's your ability to pay for the whole period. So. This is actually something that I, I want to flag as well. This could flag up later, right? Because, you, you know, depending on what amounts you put up, if they do the math, they might say, well, we don't believe you're going to have enough to actually support your entire studies here. And I think, Will, you tweeted about this. This one's really interesting. So if I toggle to the yes over here, what do we have here? Yeah, these are some of the major scholarship programs. So I think 
you know, especially for the some of the African uh, leaders of tomorrow, some of the other scholarships, the Francophonie, the Programme Canadien de... De Bourse de la Francophonie. De Bourse de la Francophonie. Uh, you know, some of these programs, you might be applying from countries that historically have really, really high refusal rates. So to, to make sure you disclose, of course, that you are a scholarship award recipient and that you're getting funding will probably help your overall application and sort you in the right category, which before they couldn't because they never had a question like this. Mm -hmm. on the form. Okay, so let's say I'm doing scholarship or bursary from an educational institution in Canada. How much money will I be receiving through them? Let's say I'm getting $10,000 in funding. Let's say the Will Tao Endowment Fund. Save and continue. Do you, have, do you want to apply for a work permit to participate in a co-op program? Let's say no for now. I'm actually just curious, what does it actually pick up? Secondary, post-secondary, post yep. Okay, so it's standard stuff. So let's put no for now. Do I have a GIC? Let's see. Ah, hey, so ah. interestingly enough, this has triggered because you said Philippines, right? Because last right. time I did this and I was a citizen of Australia, <laughs> I didn't get this question. So another way that the smart That's form great. Yeah, because on the form itself, this is not a question, but they basically put everything together. So this is good. So let's say, do I have a $10,000 GIC? Did I pay for my first year's tuition in full? Let's just say yes. Why not? And you got the medical exam. Let's say I did that. And I, let's say oh. I did this. And I let's say that I scored a band seven for CLB. Okay. Right. Let's see what happens. You are SDS now. Yay. Information about education work and other activities, post-secondary education history. Have you ever studied at a post-secondary school? You don't need to have completed. So what does that mean, Will? Have you ever studied at a post-secondary school, university, college, university, you don't have to be completed. So even if you're in, in the middle of studies, you still have to disclose your education history. But for now, you're applying for bachelors and for the interest of Simplicity. our viewers, why just say no? <laughs> yeah. Let's say I this is where I actually got screwed up because I was trying to create one and I create a bunch of different universities and degrees and I think I'll clash. Yeah. And I was like, no, we're not letting you proceed any further. So. so so just to let you guys see what's going on, if I hit yes, it basically asks for the details of that study. So say, for example, if I had started my bachelor's over in the Philippines, I would have to put that in even if I had not completed them. So for now, for the sake of simplicity, we're going to hit no. I have no military or poli police history uh, working for them. Let's see, did I work for government? Let's say I did. Let's say I did from 2009, January for a short contract of 2019, sorry, to March. Let's say work is in education law. Say for example, other, um, let's say an administrative assistant or something. Here we go. Let's say the Department of Health administrative assistant and wow it's asking for a lot eh all right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even the i don't believe even express entry the duties are asked in the same like fill in the form thing this is more akin to like the employer portal now which is really interesting right Got a lot of integrations happening right now which is let's do that let's see what so it's saying give activities for the last 10 years, eh? Okay, so I'm going to undo that. But basically, you have to disclose your history in the last 10 years if you hit yes to that question. So I'm going to delete that. Just generally just gives you an idea of what's going on here. All right, so. <laughs> this is where I got stuck earlier. Okay. You can't get out on this, but you need yeah. to. So in the last, you really have to provide your last 10 years then. That's exactly, that's another big piece. And so, no so how was it before? Let's say in the land of before, how did it yeah. look like? Well, on well, the land of before there were different practices. And in fact, on some forms, they even said, you know what? You don't need to provide your history. Some people would provide just their employment history. Some people would fill in something. Some people would put attachments. Now it's like, put it all in, which is, and it's not actually going to let you proceed until you hit a, hit that 10 years. So, so what are the um, implications for people the implications who... implications are, well, 
on your end, you're going to have a record from now all the way until when you apply for PR down the road. So you'll be able mm. to actually keep your consistent history. Hopefully that'll decrease misrepresentation if you can mm. continue your history and maintain it. And But it also goes to accuracy now, right? Because if you say something now, you can't five years later say something else because they might track it back to what you said before and say, well, nope, that your job that you're claiming now was skilled work. Well, at the time you didn't say it was skilled work. So sorry. So yeah. Anyways, lots of lots of implications for future, and and it, it makes it even more important to get it right now. So so that means that you know if you're applying for a study permit, like the implications of what you put now really has a bearing in future applications for permanent residence if that's an option that you'd like to exercise. So that basically means that you have to be very careful. I think Will's tip earlier, pro tip to actually have your personal history outlined in an Excel sheet even before going into the platform is a really good idea. So you get a bird's eye view of what's going on in your own life. Have a sort of like living resume of, you know, your occupation, even if you're unemployed, those are things that you'd like to consider and put in your living resume, right? Mm -hmm. And especially on a question like responsibility, right? Because you might be in a situation years from now being like, I need to apply for permanent residency. I had some overseas work experience Maybe at the time you did your study permit, you sort of didn't think about it too much, just wrote something or nothing. Now you're like, well, I was actually in a skilled position and immigration might come back and say, well, in your study permit, you said you were doing nothing. That's right. Why are you doing something now? So this institutional knowledge that the government will have on you, this so-called record is now much greater. So, And just as a sidebar to that, I'm not sure if you noticed this, Will, the latest update to the family information form, the privacy notice there. That, that was updated, actually. That was the only substantive update in the form. It actually gives your advanced consent to the government that they will keep this data for future applications. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so it basically goes to Will's point about the government creating a, you know, a picture of you when you're making all these other applications before you actually go on and move forward to permanent residence. The implications for misrepresentations are real, guys. So be very careful. Absolutely. I think it's one of the most common things people come to see me about when they apply for permanent residence. They go, well, on previous applications, I actually forgot to disclose this. So I actually got a refusal, but I never disclosed it. Now, like 10 years later, I want to like, I have to, uh, biometrics are coming up. I don't know if it's going to be as easy to sort of get away with it, so to speak, with these new measures in place that will sort of flag it, you know? Mm-hmm. So definitely for me electronic form means pay more attention always and not that i wouldn't pay attention normally with paper forms but Mm -hmm. this is like they're doing something with this information there's a reason they're asking it so specifically there's a reason they're separating questions i mean in terms of like an analogy i think we can put it this way back in the days when newspapers were still on paper i mean they still are you can't do a control f on paper newspapers guys but if this database actually you know, collects all the information in one centralized place where people can do a control F and look for your information, it's much easier to see if you're doing a misrepresentation, if there are errors in your application. So be careful. Just moving on uh, with travel history, I think in the context of a study permit, Will, I believe you will have something to say about this. Yes. So here's what we get. Yes. Well, you're, you're, you're asked about your travel history, which, all right. Let's go into the spiel. The federal court has said travel history is a neutral factor at most. Don Cora in Canada. But immigration officers are still refusing on the basis of travel history. Sometimes even when you have travel history, they're just still refusing on the basis of travel history. I don't know. I'm still, I'm early on, on my thoughts on this. I think it does give you an opportunity to present your case and put your travel history down. On, on the one point, though, you're not putting any travel history other than the country of citizenship and residence. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if your travel history is mostly between where you are, you know, residence now and your and home, it might not show up on this form. That's right. This actually reflects the travel history form, which is actually part of a lot of applications, but not necessarily a requirement of most study permit applications. That's so right. they're actually creating almost a, a new form requirement. Will this reduce the number of refusals on travel history? One would hope it would. Am I convinced that they're going to stop using travel history as a refusal ground, even though someone has travel history? I'm not convinced until I start seeing it. (laughs) And on the longer view too, um, one has to be mindful of what you put in the travel history. 
it does ask for five years. But if memory serves me right, if you're doing an express entry application for permanent residence, they ask for 10 years. So guys, make sure that you're reconciling this. And just like a living resume for your job, you know, occupations in the last 10 years, probably a good idea to actually have a log of your travel really anywhere, including your country of residence and country of citizenship, just because at some point you may be moving out of that country of residence. And at that point where you're applying for PR, you now have to report the uh, you know, country of residence that you are no longer a resident of at the time of PR application. So keep a live travel history log just so you protect yourself. Mm -hmm. And right. I suspect that they might ask, ask for more police certificates and so forth as well mm -hmm. now that they have your your travel history in more detail. So those are things that you can probably check in the pipeline. I don't know about you, Will, when I do my client intake, my detailed client intake, I always ask for the 10 years and my system actually automatically alerts me to my client's whereabouts if they actually have six months somewhere so then I sit down with my clients and I talk to them about it. So let's hit no for now and see what happens. So travel history, have you stayed in Canada? So these are the declaration questions. Do you want to talk about them, Will? Let's well, talk. the one thing that's exciting about this, and it's it's been a long time coming, but definitely something to celebrate, is when you hit yes to one of these questions, you actually have a little bit more space to tell your yes. story now. 500 words. So, yay, you're not stuck using... Right. In the land of before, it was like maybe three lines at most. So Your acronyms about... of like TRV, refuse. Right. Yeah. I, I've never three. abbreviated so many words in the, you know, <laughs> you know, I would usually include, a, you know, an explanation letters for, for these refusals for some of my clients. But this is great. It's now 500 characters. You guys have more space to put details to what and happened. I remember put all the details, like just to give an example of a matter I, I saw recently, you know, an individual was refused a study permit application for, and th luckily they weren't given a misrep, but they said that they failed to disclose a previous, previous refusals to the United States. What they did was they included one of the refusals and because there was not a space, they had a bunch of other Canadian ones. They just listed those and it was okay for three, four applications. Well, on the fifth application, they found something else to bring it back. Right. That's so right. as That's you keep applying and you try and reduce the number of reasons for refusal, they could still find something like this to try and refuse your application. And in the worst case, give you a misrep. Use the 500 words wisely and explain everything. Right. Because information sharing networks are so deep now. They're, they know every single application you've done to the U.S., whether you've been refused or not. So. All right. So have you ever been refused a visa permit, denied entry to or ordered to leave any country or territory? What's the question? Well, I think you answered the question above. It, it might have, it maybe should have been for the, the one below there. Yeah, no, that's true. And actually, this, this actually brings me to my point. So this one is for Canada. This one is for any other country. So if you go to form 1294, this is actually combined if memory serves me right. Have you been refused a visa? No, so, so actually, they're separate questions. But the question that's uh, actually laid out in form 1294 is have you ever been refused a visa permit denied to denied entry to or ordered to leave Canada or any or other any country? country? Now it says any country. So exactly. any country includes Canada. So, so don't forget your Canadian ones. So yeah, so most people think that it's just Canada because that's the first word they see and then they forget the or any other country. I do get a lot of consultations and I have clients coming to me asking for help on how to fix that because they got through like the first, second time that they applied. And now that we're putting in a third or fourth application, it has to be disclosed properly and taken care of. Make sure that, uh, you know, they don't get hit with a misrepresentation finding. If you have been issued a permit since that refusal, oh. provide the document number with the date of issue and expiry date. Ah. I mean, I guess, so that means like, did you eventually become successful? So yeah, so the, the, the answer that I put here is it's a B1 or B2 visa, which is the visitor visa in the U.S. due to weak ties in home country in 2010, 2012, refused, then approved on third try in 2015. Doc number, let's say XX435. What else are they asking for? Date of issue. Issued 2015, let's say January 15th. All right. So it says only characters from the Roman script and alphabet can be entered. So I think it's this. So I think it's that. <laughs> <Yep. one> two. <laughs> All right. 
Great, so let's hit save and continue. Where does it bring us next? Let's say that you've been actually, you've actually committed a crime. This is actually really interesting. I wanna see what would happen if you committed a crime. Before we actually hit yes, interestingly, look at this, Will. There, there, there are more questions to criminality now compared to 1294. So it actually specifies, this includes dry, driving under the influence of alcohol and drugs. I think this is relevant to highlight at this point because it's now considered a serious crime in Canada, whereas in other countries, it's still, it's not considered as a serious crime. So let's say we hit yes, as Will suggested. So provide as many details as possible. And you also have 500 characters. So let's say charged and convicted, uh, charged and pled guilty to DUI in California in 2008. 2015. This question has always been problematic. And I know Peter Edelman back when uh, now Justice Edelman, when he was at our firm, wanted to have everyone disclose that, you know what, we've all committed crimes. We've all jaywalked. We've all done something wrong. <laughs> this question is really problematic, but that all that to say now you really have to go and provide some of the detail. And again, detail was asked for, but it gives you more space to do so now. It's always a question of whether how much you want to disclose now versus how much, for example, you don't have all the court documents yet, or if there is actually a real question on equivalency and you might need to fight it out later. That's something that I would for sure, if I were in your shoes, that that's something where it might start making sense to contact a lawyer for a consultation on because criminality and equivalency is not the easiest thing for someone dealing with it themselves on. To highlight that point, I would say that not all immigration lawyers actually do it because it's a very discrete area of immigration law. We call it crimmigration. So guys, get a consultation if you're facing this kind of problem. So let's see, have you ever been arrested or for any criminal offense in any country or territory? So there's a breakdown here, Will. Commission, mm -hmm. arrest, charge and conviction. So actually this one is still yes <laughs> and would be the same. Well, this is another interesting issue because you can be found in a missile for committing something even though you haven't been arrested or charged, right? So again, once you get to this section and now especially with how much detail they're asking, it's it's very good to make sure you know the consequences of what you're writing down for sure. Let's just put it this way. If you're answering yes to any of these questions, guys, consult. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so let's repeat this here. Have you ever been convicted for any criminal? No, that's it. I mean, it's a guilty. Okay, so other security questions and criminality questions. Let's just answer no to these ones, yeah. just for the interest of time. And this one is about witnessing or participation in ill treatment of prisoners, civilians, looting, desecration of religious. You're people. asking about your 34, 35, 37 series. Exactly. Ones. Last two years, were you diagnosed with tuberculosis? No. Let's just say no. And have you been in close contact with someone with tuberculosis in the last five years? Let's say no. Are you currently receiving dialysis? So interestingly, in, one, uh, in form 129 form, the land of before, the questions about health issues, they're not going to drill down this deep. Mm -hmm. They're actually asking for very specific questions now. Yeah. Wow. Especially on the mental health and the drug and alcohol addiction. That's, right. that's a big change. Definitely something to think about. And also difficult to actually answer for those who are involved. On the one hand, I like the fact that it's actually, these are now more specific questions, less vagueness to the questions would be good for the person doing it. But you're right, it makes it more difficult, especially for those who are dealing with mental issues, right? So, mental. Uh, mental health issues, sorry. Let's go ahead and move on. And family status, let's say I'm let's single. Call them single for now. Do I have a biological child, adopted or stepchild? I'm just gonna say no. So what's the implication? Well, if I said no and, you know, later on, I declare that I did have one. What's 117.9? I mean, right? For, for a PR application anyway. But on the, you know, on the face of it, at least it's a misrepresentation finding, right? Absolutely. That's uh, an issue that can follow you. It can lead to, uh, eventually, if you are applying for permanent residence, to misrepresentation issues. And also, of course, if you continue this issue all the way to permanent residency and you don't disclose, that could be a 179 issue. Mm. And then, yeah, it, it's definitely something that's a low-hanging fruit, so they, so they call it for inadmissibility. 
So let's hit save and continue. Uh, let's say I know who my parents are. <laughs> so this is starting to get to the equivalent of the family information form. That's right. Present occupation, retired, no, and he is living in the U.S. Oh, interesting. So it looks like the, you know, auto feed for the address isn't just for Canada. It also does it for the U.S. Uh, let's say 909 Palm Avenue, West oh, Hollywood. Individuals won't forget their postal code anymore, which is always a good exactly. thing. Exactly. That's right. So yeah, so this one, I just put that there and it auto feeds it into the form. That's brilliant. They even have the four four digit extension to the postal code in the US. This is amazing. We're gonna probably see this for spousals coming pretty soon. I think. Yeah, so I have my father there. Now I wanna add my mother, let's say. Guys, fictitious, don't look them up by the way. <laughs> let's see, person come with. So let's try another country. Let's see if it auto fills. No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. ah, so it's just the US and Canada. Interesting, okay. Cool. All right, let's uh, just leave that there for now. Oh, I hit cancel, sorry. All right, so, okay guys, we're finally there. Sorry about that. Let's hit save and continue. All right, what is my native language? That would be Tagalog, and can I speak in English or French both? Let's say English. And you want me to, uh, I want to be contacted in English. Okay, good. Email address. Sounds good. We're almost getting to the point of uploading our documents. That's Yay. Right. Okay, there's no data to display. Add a phone number. Let's see. A cellular, a telephone number, other. Okay, dial code would be a country code. Let's say 63 for the Philippines. Phone number 915-406-1234, let's just say. And I think this is the part where you can actually go back and edit your information. Wow. But look That's at this, Will. Cool. Compared to the classic study permit application, look at the breadth and depth of information that they're collecting now. Yeah, can you hit expand all? Wow. <laughs> okay, oh, so wow. you can actually now print and save a whole copy and that's right. As so LJ is showing, I would definitely do this. I would definitely print a PDF version of this, guys. Just Most times, records. Yeah, for your own records, this is probably going to be as useful as an A tip usually is in a lot of cases. I mean, sometimes clients will submit forms and those forms, you know, go out of date or information changes. This is a good way to sort of crystallize exactly what you put in. And if you need someone to review it later, if there's a refusal, you probably want to be sending us this PDF. So another tip for something that'll help and save you money, by the way, if, if you're doing this, because if you engage save us you. and we have to do eight tips and requests and everything else, we're going to be spending a lot more time than if you That's have right. the same information so okay cool so it's good to know that that function is there all right so i can go and collapse that again but look at the breadth and depth of that that is very different from what we are used to for a study permit application for sure all in one spot not multiple forms not mm -hmm. scan not this it's all there so it's i think a that's game changer from a government perspective so wonderful for sure yeah. All right, so I hit next. So this is the part where Will was saying that you get to upload your stuff in. So supporting documents and optional documents. So you have your letter of acceptance, pretty standard. Since this is an SDS application or study direct stream, you need to have your IELTS for sure. I always get asked this question, well, I don't know about you, but you know, when applying for a study permit, is it required to do a language test? Yes and no, depends on the institution where you're going to. Sometimes they waive that requirement depending on where you're coming from. There's also funds, obviously, police certificates, proof of receipt of funding, passport, travel document, and GIC. Interesting how they broke that down because in the traditional application portals, the receipt of funding and the GIC would be under the same category. 
even your bank accounts, really. So they broke it up. And remember, we enabled SDS here. That's why there's a GIC requirement. And for the receipt of funding, it's because we said that we are, uh, that I am a scholar of the Wiltau Endowment Fund. So let's see, passport document and non-immigrant visa to the U.S. Wow, that's interesting. That's new. Okay. Transcripts, consent uh, for personal information. This is interesting. What is this? Complete this form if you authorize IRCC and CBSA to release information from your case. Yep. Okay, right, right. Another thing that's really interesting is how it's all in additional documents now where like letter of explanation or the study plan used to be its own thing that you would put in or select. Now I believe it's all encapsulated into the additional documents, big subfolders. So in terms of you as an applicant making clear to the officer where everything is, you're going to have to do a much better job, I would say, of organizing that all in the additional documents. Because if you think about all the letters of support, if you have family members explaining things, if you, your ties to your home country, right. all under two megabytes. I was going to get to that. Yeah, guys, like, look at this. File size and accepted formats, that's pretty standard for the formats. But what's interesting here is it's only two megabytes. So the traditional portals, you usually had about four megabytes as a maximum. And I'm going to tell you all that from my experience anyway, putting things together in a four megabyte file is often a challenge. If I'm putting together the study plan, I'm putting together ties to home country, letters of explanation, uh, support letters. So now that it's been reduced by 50%, that's going to be an even bigger challenge to be very brief and to be very selective of what information and evidence you have. One second, though, I'm, I'm kind of tripped out by this. If you have four documents to submit, each document can be a maximum of two MB. Can you go into one of them and see if you can submit multiple documents? I'm actually curious. Oh, know. that's a good point. Okay. I don't think so, but let's let's try. I want to create a dummy. See if you can add four documents that are two megabytes each under the additional documents. For sure. If you can do that, then I think we'll have to do some editing on this video. And I think that's a good thing, obviously, for immigration. Yeah. Let's see. So let's go into additional documents. If that is the case. And four becomes eight, possibly. Quite possibly. Let's see. Oh, nope. it doesn't. Ah, so even the wording of that is a little bit unclear. Really, all you got is two megabytes. Wow. So you have to compile that file. What so you, if you, can you go up and give us one upload field? What sure. does it say? If your files begin to be, you need to provide multiple file in one or oh, reduce file size, add multiple. Or search for reduce file size or add multiple files. Hmm. So it's essentially a question of compiling your documents into one file. Uh, they do have a how-to guide, but again, it goes back to the challenge of compressing, let's say, 100 pages into a two megabyte file. I pride myself of having been able to put together a 150 page document that was still legible in a four megabyte file. But uh, yeah, two megabytes is quite the challenge. That's okay. gonna be tough. Yep. Especially for colored copies of things and things like that. That's gonna be tough, especially for like previous academic records and stuff. That's right. These files may have to be just smaller. I think that that could be just a consequence. Maybe they're tired of dealing with so much information. I don't know. That it seems to me like they needed to make that a little bit larger in size, I would say. But what, one, one other thing that I also want to say is that, you know, there's no submission letter portion or like, I think you hinted on this earlier, there's no a slot for a study plan, just a study plan. So this is actually going to have to go into additional documents if this is the case. We're not going to go forward after this page, guys. Uh, what we're, we're, we're get, you know, what we can say is that the next page will most likely be about payment. So it'll collect your payment information and then you can submit it. And basically you have to consent and make an electronic declaration that, you know, the, the application is complete, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Terms and conditions apply. This has been a very uh, enlightening educational session for both of us. I hope that you guys also found it to be very useful. Absolutely. So why don't we do this as a parting thought why don't you choose one thing you really like and one thing you don't like about this new portal? And maybe we can ask our viewers and those who are also learning and walking through this, be it if you're a representative or if you're mm. self-rep, 
let us know in, in the comments to the channel or in, yeah. in feedback to us. And I think we can start providing some feedback to IRCC. To yeah. So what, what's your one like good thing about this? Well, I'm going to start with the bad, if I can. I think you're okay, not going we'll to start with the bad. I'll get the bad thing out of the way. I, I want to end with a good note. You wouldn't be surprised if I'm going to say that I really dislike the fact that we're down to two megabytes. I was hoping that they would increase it to 10 actually this time around. But I guess, you know, there might be a reason why they've actually reduced it to two. As you said, uh, maybe they're tired of handling too many documents. I, I'm hoping it's just an oversight <laughs> that they're going to increase this eventually to four and back to four, maybe even going up to 10. Who knows? But yeah, if anyone from IRCC is out there listening, please, please, please in increase this size. Two megabytes, really hard to work with. Good thing that I really, really like about this is the fact that these are essentially unified forms. You don't have to work with multiple forms that sometimes forces clients or self-representing applicants into, you know, innocent mistakes that as we know, could have heavy repercussions down the road because of, you know, a simple moment of inattention. So it's great that you have that, you know, integrated approach into all the forms, the information capture process that you have put up. And I guess that that basically puts the uh, client at a better position to actually archive a copy of, uh, you know, all the information that they pass on to immigration. So my bad would be, I think that they needed to create more options for you to upload documents and it's sort of working off what you said not only is a two megabyte issue a problem but for something like the letter of uh, explanation or study plan which i think is quintessential to every single application they probably should have created a separate section yeah. so that you can utilize the additional documents to add your uh, cover letter or add your index or things that you need for that section i think forcing all of it into the additional document section is going to create some challenges for applicants and maybe the inability to put all the information forward. My positive and pro of this all is I think that that actually, and again, working off yours, that final page where you can actually print and, and, and save and record everything and how this will likely limit the number of applications that bounce back as incomplete or you, know, you have to put in postal codes, certain things you have to put in, they're gonna ask for it. You can't complete tenure history without filling certain things in. You got more space now to put in the past refusals and, and explanations. Those are good things. So it's, just, it's exciting, but I think there, is a there are a few more tweaks that are needed to be you know, just added into the system before it's ready to fully go, I would say. Right, and just to add to that, point that you're raising. I mean, I understand that this is also a work in progress on the part of immigration. And honestly, I am impressed overall with the user interface, the user experience. It's very clear that they have invested a good sum of money into putting this up. Three cheers for, for immigration for doing this. I'm very happy about it. But yeah, guys, like, you know, there are things. Let's, let's work together to find those kinks and uh, hopefully those things get improved as we go along. Wonderful. So, well, thank you, LJ. It was a blast walking through this. I think it's going to benefit our own clients when we're doing with this, this with them in <laughs> person. Learned a lot, got a lot of ideas and a lot of things that I'm, I'm going to work with and think Absolutely. through. Absolutely. But yeah, it's been a blast. And I hopeful, hopefully for those of you who are learning about learning this to the first time too, that this video is a fun and light <laughs> of walking through it we saved you the trouble of creating that fake email account that you have to utilize so. <laughs> yeah all right oh great so yeah this is episode eight of Light. thank you so much for joining us until next time <laughs>